Hello there, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, James here as ever, for today's ACCA SPR video, reviewing the Lunar Co question, which was from the March and June 2022 specimen paper. And I know you've clicked on this video going, oh my word, James, you are about to save my life. You're going to go through it from start to finish, reviewing the requirements and the scenario and the solutions. It's a 30 mark question so I don't have to do it myself. Well, I would recommend that maybe even if you had a long day at work, pause the video, have a go at it after we've gone through the scenario analysis, and then watch the video to the end. I know it's a bit long, but this is a 30 mark question. In the real exam, you'd have 54 minutes. And as you can see from behind me, it's a lovely sunny day here. I'm inside doing some SBR to help you out. So I'd really appreciate it if you gave the video a massive like and thumbs up. And leave me a comment below any other requests you'd like me to do for the channel and what you actually thought of the video and how you actually got on in the exam. Also, if it's the first time you've been to my channel, we always give a shout out for every single video. So as you can see above me, Master Rubric, thank you so much for the lovely comment on there. And this is designed to help you out, my friend. Question practice, top to bottom, a full on review and it's gonna help you pick up on those extra marks that can make the difference in getting you a pass because it's so tough this exam with around about a 50% pass rate. If you haven't already, I put all the up-to-date books in the description below and I also talk through about flashcards that help you with the accounting standards that I used to use that help me to pass. So the links are down there, they're the ones I'd recommend and they're definitely gonna help you to remember them when, especially when it comes to revision. So if you haven't already downloaded the question, the link is down in the description below of this video, along with the timings for Luna Co. And have a go at it on the computer base, the CBE platform. That's definitely going to help you out with your exam preparation. But this is what you should have on your screen. And we're going to walk and talk it through. So stick around to the end of the video. I'm going to do the donkey work for you. And this is the question we have on here for Luna Co. Standard bog standard sort of question where we've got a bit of scenario, we've got some figures on there, then we've got the requirement at the bottom, and I can I can hear, hear you through my camera, through my lovely little office, where the magic happens, going, oh my word, James, save me. This, this, this is a bit, oh gosh, 30 marks. Would I let you down? This is some of my notes as we go through, these are the things that, if you've never watched one of these videos before, everything underlined are the key facts and key figures that I picked up on in my analysis. And as you can see on the screen, we've got some other little bits of text on there, just to put it in my sort of easy to digest language that sort of what was James thinking at that point and what does it actually mean in simple terms? So first of all, if I had to do the SBR exam and this question came up, as you can see on here, we, you've got to be familiar with the CBE platform. So we've got four different exhibits. And for the video, I've tried to reference them. So they're color coded on the side that you can just about see them above me on here. So we've got uh, the companies about Lunaco. We've got Starlight Co. We've got uh, Rocket Co. and Eclipse Co. And this is before we'd even looked at absolutely anything on here. Next thing to note down is this is a 30, 30 mark requirement. So you've got 180 minutes in your examination, 100 marks, so you should be spending no more than 54 minutes on this question. SBR is time pressured enough, so you've got to be really, really strict to move on on there. But the first thing you should do in any ACCA question is ignore all those adjustments, all those key things on there. You've got to go straight the way to the requirement. That is where we then start to understand what is going on in this question. And it's a real good technique within SBR that when you're going through the scenario, which we'll touch on later on, picking up on those key facts and key figures that link into each requirement. Now, first of all, we talked about that time management. If you want to get it jotted down on the side there, I've put, we've got for the seven mark question in part, part one, we've got just over 12 minutes. For part two on there, we've got six marks, so just over 10 minutes. Uh, for part three in section A, we've got four marks, so that's just over seven minutes. Then coming on to part B, we've got seven marks, just over 12 minutes. And then finally, 
when your brain will be bamboozled in section C. Uh, we've got, again, just over 10 minutes on there. Sounds like a lot of time, but trust me, when we go through the overall answer analysis, along with the 54 minutes total for this. Now, first things first, as where the external examiner constantly tells us in the examiner's report is that students don't answer the full requirement in the SBR exam. So this is why it is so important that when you're going through these requirements, we start to understand and pick out. So you'll see these little twos and little ones on my screen on here, or the A's and B's. This is what I used to do when I used to sit these exams uh, before getting qualified. It's all right, though. <laughs> but uh, I used to follow it and guide my answers so that it meant that I answered the full 30 marks on there. I didn't necessarily get all 30 marks, but it meant that I had a better chance of passing, which was quite lucky on this one that I did. So coming on to it, first of all, the only other thing I'd have looked at before coming to the requirement is that bit there. So we talked about it, the sale of shares, sale of goods on there, and I'd maybe read the sort of little introduction, but we'll come on to that later on. It's all about the requirement, first of all, that number A, we've got explain with calculations. There's my little one and two. Uh, considering both of the aspects that we've got to consider on there about how the disposal of shares in Starlight Co. should be accounted for. So this is where you have to make sure that you've done both tasks using the word processor and the Excel sheet on there. In the consolidation financial statements of the Luna Group for the year ended 31st of March 2006. So this is in the consolidated uh, accounts on there for the financial statements. We've got an actual uh, disposal of shares, that's what we're going to be looking for in Exhibit 1. Then we've got for Part 2, discuss the principles that should be considered by Lunaco in recording the sale of goods, sale of the goods, should I say, to Starlight Co. in Lunaco's individual financial statements, again, for the year ended 31st of March 2006. And when I see uh, recording sales on there, and we've already seen the disposal of some shares, my mind's thinking, intergroup transactions, who's the parent, who's the subsidiary. We're going to find out more about this when we go through the requirement. Again, same year end, and finally conclude on whether the accounting treatment currently adopted is correct. So you've got to make a judgment on your answer, and based on your facts and figures and your analysis, notice as well, finally on there, the individual accounts for this requirement, not the consolidated ones, so that is what you must base your, your judgment on to say. In your answer, it should say, yes, they are correct, no, they are not, and then justify why. Next, for part A, we have using exhibits one and two only. Gosh, give me strength on this. The external examiner always says that students, even though they write down exhibits one and two only, still include information from three and four. That is not what they're looking for only one and two. Please put that down in your notes. Pen and paper at the ready. We've got so many to take down today because we've got to present the extracts. So that's calculations and adjustments that should be included in the consolidated statement of profit and loss on there. So using the figures directly from the exhibits of the Lunar Group, for again, for the year ended 31st of March 2006, your answers should include, now this is it, don't get overwhelmed on this. This is where you've got to really home in revenue, cost of sales, and the profit of Starlight attributable to the non-controlling interest. So in other words, you've got to have three sections on there saying, right, what's the, the revenue for the consolidation with any adjustments, and then also for the NCI. So you've got to answer all three elements. And you think, good grief, that was a lot for four marks. But we'll go through it. You'll be able to pick up minimum two pretty easy on that. So let's come on to B now. And as you can see, again, we've got discuss with calculations. So have a look if you've already attempted this before watching this video, what you're picking up on new now. And this is all about how the investment in Rocket Co and the sale of the property. So we've got two transactions or events that we need to consider here should be accounted for in the consolidated financial statements of the Luna Group again for that same year end of 31st of March 2006. So you must include both on there for the seven marks. It's going to be split sort of three and three with, a, with an extra sort of working mark on there. 
but it's up to you to include both elements. Discuss it and calculate it. Finally, on that, we were asked in section C to discuss whether the acquisition of Eclipco should be treated as a business combination in accordance with IFRS 3. So these are the actual standards that we need to be putting into practice, especially in SBR. The key thing to get down in your note is we've been given in section C here, IFRS 3. However, there are other accounting standards that apply to sections A and B that we've just gone through in the requirement. So number one, we've got to identify those actual accounting standards that it relates to when we go through the actual requirements and the scenario. And then two, th this is one of the main reasons why people pass SBR and the other reason why people fail it is the application to the scenario of those actual standards that the marker is looking for you to implement. So just pop down in your notes. Application, application, application. Trust me, you'll see it when we go through the solutions, it is imperative in what the marker is looking for. So your answer here for IFR, IFRS 3 business combinations, uh, your answer should include whether the skills and experience, so those little keywords on there, we need to be seeing in your answer, um, of the team of scientists can be recognized as a separate identifiable asset on there. So again, a balance sheet transaction, how do we account for the skills of the scientists? Again, we've not even been through the requirement yet, but got a really good understanding of what we've got so far. So we've got some sale of shares, we've got intergroup transactions, and we've got some um, consolidation profit and loss adjustments on there. Uh, we've also got investments and sale of property, and finally business combinations before we've even looked at anything in the actual scenario. So that's what I think about when I see a question analysis, uh, a requirement analysis, before we've even got stuck into the question. So notice the detail I'm trying to go into that is going to help you out on that. So before we go through each of the exhibits, and again, this is where it will play a part that if you're good on the uh, CBE platform, like going through each of the exhibits, see where it all forms, you will save time and you'll pick up on more specific marks. Being specific in this exam is so important. So that's the first part, gone through the actual requirement analysis. Now we're coming on to the scenario analysis. This is where we really have to understand what is going on in each area and how we're going to apply it. So first of all, we've got Lunaco is the parent company of a group that operates in the pharmaceutical industry all entities in the group have a financial year end of the 31st of March. So we've seen 31st of March in those requirements, spot on, and the current year end is the 31st of March 2006. That links into every single requirement at the end. So that's, that's where it's all aligned. We may have some adjustments as we go through uh, the actual uh, exhibits, but we'll have to see on that. Obviously, I don't want to steal my thunder as we go through. Um, little notes on here. If you want to jot down, if you had a scrap piece of paper about the group structure, I know students find that really helpful, especially when we get into some of the technical aspects later on into the video. I've also highlighted on their pharmaceutical industry because in your discussions, you can talk about the type of product, type of service, type of industry, and you'll be given credit if you link that back to the actual requirements. So if it's a a pro or a con, is it going to link into cash flow, profitability, whatever it may be, risk, there are so many different factors, but don't overlook it. It could just be that one little statement about the type of industry that, it, that the company's working in that could get you that extra little mark that you should be trying to fish for at the end of the exam. All entities in the group, as we said, have got that financial year end on there. So check the dates and scenario details and for apportioning. But coming on to the exhibit, so what this is basically saying here for the one to four is saying in the set in these exhibits on the left hand side here, I'll put the mouse on it for you. This is where it just goes into a bit more detail. So from the sale of shares in Sire Co, we're provided the information regarding the disposal of shares uh, by Lunaco in Starlight Co during this actual um, accounting period on here. So again, the, the, the triggers, the questions you've got to be asking in your mind are, Right, what's the impact on the group structure? Does Lunaco, as the parent, still have control? 
and what are the percentage ownerships of the direct and indirect from the parents perspective and the NCI. Remember we've, we've got a hint of NCI, we've already seen it in another requirement. Um, again, careful on the dates of the events, we've not seen them yet. But coming on to the sale of goods to Starlight Co, so it provides information regarding a sale of goods. So again, intergroup transactions, and for anyone who uh, isn't aware of that yet, maybe you're early in your studies, it's, it's companies within a group where they sell from one to another. So you've got to identify, is it the parent selling to the subsidiary or the subsidiary selling to the parent? Because there'll be different treatments for that. And then finally on there, we've got um, how we're going to actually uh, recognize the actual revenue. And we've got the PERP calculations on there. And I spelt calculations wrong, but hey ho, it's all right. We're on the right lines for the provision for unrealized profit. So when you're selling goods to one to another, that is where we need to work out how much we sold and the profit that was on there that we need to adjust for. Coming on to part three for Rocketco, uh, provides information about the creation of Rocketco, including details of the sale of property from Lunaco to Rocketco. Okay, so brilliant. It's created the company and the sale of the property, or what we've seen in the requirement below. And this is where it's gonna link into uh, business combinations and sort of what value are we looking at there? So in terms of when we created it, what was the market value? Um, have we got any um, carrying value on there? Gosh, that's another. James, two out of two spelling mistakes. Not very good, but you get the gist on it. It's all right. Eclipco provides information about the acquisition of Eclipco on there. So again, things and questions that go through our mind, parent, subsidiary, associates, what we're talking about here in terms of the group structure, and that again, for you to jot down in your notes, or if you've got a scrap piece of paper on there that can help you picture it better. The final thing I'd get down is to draw a timeline um, in front of you, or if you're using just the CBE platform, you can use a scratch pad. The key date here is to identify, identify the first day of the accounting period. So we've been told the year end is the 31st of March, 2006. So that must mean the first day of the 12 month period is the 1st of April 2005 and that's going to be really key when we go through these scenarios now. So let's keep the ball rolling on there. I'll obviously update those notes in terms of uh, the spelling corrections but if you want a copy of the notes I'll put a link down below as to where you can access them and where you can follow them through as well. But exhibit one coming on to it now and for anyone who's not looked at my notes before, this is where everything underlined are the key facts, the key figures, the key dates on here. And then you also have on the side some other little notes that are just reminders to me and other things that I was thinking about that are gonna help you to be really spot on in terms of your analysis for this question. So Luna Co acquired 80% of the equity interest in Starlight Co on the 1st of April, 2002. So this is not in the current accounting period and was three, four years beforehand. Starlight Co had in issue $1 million equity shares and has not issued any other shares for many years on there. That's all about Starlight Co and it's saying that Luna has, has sold some of this that we know from the requirements and the analysis above. Goodwill on acquisition, so that's on the 1st of April 2002, was correctly calculated at $320,000 but had subsequently been impaired by 15% in 2004. Okay, so we're gonna have a little adjustment there for the 15% that we're gonna to have to reduce that down. Lunaco values the NCI at fair value. The fair value of the net assets of Starlight Co at acquisition exceeded their carrying amount by $200,000. So again, another adjustment on there. This all related to the non-depreciable non land, which is still owned by Starlight Co as at the current year end of the 31st of March 2006. So we've got a fair value adjustment needed there. We've got a goodwill adjustment to reduce it down. So you can see my little note on the side there to say if I'm going to reduce it down, multiply it by 0.85. And again, show your workings. You can use the Excel tab for that. But then we've also been given on the 1st of January 2006, so this is where the little note, nine months into the accounting period, Lunaco sold 100,000 equity shares in Starlight Co for $7 a share. So nine months into the period, 
the only reserve within equity in the individual statement of financial position of Starlight Co., so the subsidiary, is retained earnings on there. The balance of this reserve as at the start of the year was $4.658 million and Starlight Co. generated a profit for the year ended 31st of March 2006 of $165.56 on there, which accrued evenly throughout the year. That's a really important statement, accrued evenly throughout the year, because we're going to actually have to apportion it for the actual nine months. So we owned it for nine months, and then we've got three months of when it was reduced down on there. And we've got 100,000 equity shares that were sold out of the 1 million. So it's a reduction of 10% holding. And again, key to identify at the start of the period, but it also, another key thing to note on here, it doesn't say who the shares were sold to as well when I was going through it. So again, another reasonable point you could touch on in your analysis. So that takes us through exhibit one. Now we're coming on to exhibit two. And again, I'm just doing this for the video where I go through it one by one. Maybe in your exam you want to do right, requirement A, exhibit one, get it done. Then move on to the next one. Whatever works best for you, I'm just trying to keep it simple, go through one by one, and then we'll go through the solutions one by one on there as well. So on the 20th of March uh, 2006, Lunaco sold 5,000 units to Starlight Co. So this is the parent selling to the subsidiary before the current year end at an initial transaction price of $200 per unit and control of these goods passed to Lunaco, uh, sorry, passed from Lunaco to Starlight Co. on that date. So that's the key note on that. Ask yourself right now, have the risks and reward of the ownership of these goods been transferred or not from one party to another? That's really key in terms of the recognition on there. And that is a hint as to the next few bits that will be going on to on there. So you should be, when I say the word recognition, you've got to be thinking, ah, know what he means now. The payment is only due when Starlight Co. sells the goods onto the end customer, which typically takes around six months. So that's going to be after the year end. Starlight Co. has not yet sold any goods onto the final customer as at the 31st of March 2000 of 2006. So in other words, as I've got here, end of the year, end of the accounting period, they've received the goods but not sold any, and then they'll be selling them most likely six months after the year end. So in terms of the recognition of that, who holds the risks and rewards should be going through your mind now. Next, we've got the goods have a high risk of obsolescence and therefore price concessions are regularly granted uh, in order that the goods can be easily transferred on within the distribution channel. So concessions, that means we're gonna give a small discount on there in order to get rid of them. So on the basis of uh, past practice, Lunaco anticipates that it will grant Starlight Co. a concession of between 8% to 38%. So that's a massive um, discount on there or concession. And this is going to be linked to how much revenue should be recognised on there. Because the current market data suggests that a maximum price concession of 35% may be necessary to enable Starlight Co. to distribute the goods to the final consumer. So think of the percentages on there. We got told first of all, eight to 38%. Then we've now got 35 as a maximum on there. So maybe we've got to be thinking about averages, what to take, should we take an eight? Should we take 38? Should we take 35? Should we take another estimate? And this is where your professional judgment is gonna come into it. Next, we come on to the initial cost of the goods to Lunaco was $80 per unit. Lunaco has recorded the sale at the initial transaction price of $200. Okay, so two figures on there. How are we going to account for it? Starlight Co. has included the goods within their closing inventory at a value of $1 billion. So you've got to be thinking now, these are the figures we've got to be considering for those intergroup transaction and the provision for unrealized profit. Next, we've got the revenue and costs of sales for the respective entities for the year ended 31st of March are as follows. So we've got some adjustments here. What you've got to be saying to yourself, what values are going to be overstated? What are going to be understated? How are we going to deduct? 
And this is where it really shows up a student that's got good question practice here because the alarm bell should be ringing to say, hang on, I've seen in the requirement revenue, cost of sales, uh, we're also going to have an NCI adjustment on there. We've had a reduction in the overall control from the parent of 10%. So that's going to push up the NCI percentage by 10% on there. So just little hints, little questions that you've got to be asking yourself as you go through. Exhibit three for Rocket Co. So again, try and focus your mind off one requirement to the other. Stay focused in on it. And before the start of the accounting period, asked for in the requirements. So this is where we've got the 1st of April 2004. So Lunaco, the parent, and an unconnected third party established a joint arrangement involving the creation of a joint venture. So Roquetco, each venture paid six million in cash. So that's capital introduced to the newly created entity, Roquetco, in exchange for a 50% interest in the equity shares on there. So Lunaco is going to be a 50% shareholding on there. Roquetco has earned profits for the year of $73,450 and $126,980 in years of the 31st of March 2005 and 2006 respectively. So the year before and the year of the current accounting period and we've owned them from the start of those two profiting years so no apportioning on that basis. Additionally, Roquetco paid dividends to both Lunaco and the other venture of $15,000 each in the current year. This was the first time Roquetco had paid dividends uh, to its investors. So you've got to be thinking back to your financial reporting knowledge here. You've got your profits, less your actual dividends, and that is going to give you your final net figure on there. So you've got a 15,000 adjustment to the profit figure needed for of the actual 2006 year. I'm giving quite away on this actually, I should have been more harsh. But um, on the 31st of March 2006, Lunaco transferred a property to Roquetco. And this is where, because we've got that joint venture and we've got the actual um, parent involved, this is what is known, if you've got to want to get it down in your notes, as a downstream transaction, where the proceeds of $8 million, which is agreed to be equal to the market value of the property on that date. However, the carrying amount of the property in the financial statements of Luna as at that date was 10 million. So there, this is where we're getting it from as to, well, we're now needing an adjustment of $2 million because we've got one value in Luna's accounts, they've transferred it over, so we're gonna to have to have a reduction of $2 million on there. Finally, coming on to exhibit four, Eclipco, and you're there going, oh, James, this, this is going to be a piece of cake, this question. Gosh, loving it. But uh, Eclipco is an entity which has a sole purpose of producing a new medicine. So remember we talked about it's in the pharmaceutical industry. That really links in, and I put, put on there for possible synergies with Lunaco, um, to fight various diseases, having secured a license to do so following a, a successful initial trials. On there. So we've got to be considering as to, right, have we got an asset here? Is it tangible? Is it intangible? Because Eclipco's employees consist of a highly skilled team of scientists. There are also a small support team under contract who carry out various administrative and accounting functions. Clinical tests undertaken by the team of scientists have been extremely encouraging and it's expected that the medicine will be on the market sometime in the next year. Okay, so we've got, we've got full time, and we've got contract-based workforce to a part of this. We've got a license. They're doing um, actual sort of research and development into new clinical tests. So think about this from a business combination perspective. How many elements have we got here as well? On the 31st of March now, so 2006, Lunaco acquired 100% of Eclipco. So the parent has full control of this entity. Um, and this is within the current accounting period. It was also decided that it would be important to retain the contracts of the team of scientists. Well, that's the unique selling point on there without them, how they meant to conduct it. Although not the administrative employees, as there, were, as there was considerable specialized knowledge and experience within the team. The only assets recognized in the individual financial statements of Eclipco at the 31st of March 
uh, 2006. Remember when the parent purchased the, uh, the actual company. Consisted of the license to manufacture the medicine and the related development costs. So some of them might have been capitalized, expensed on there. Well, they're in the assets been capitalized, haven't they? So, however, the Lunaco estimated it was worth paying an extra 1.5 million in consideration in order to secure the skills and experience of the team of scientists. So we've got to working out if we've got some revenue expenditure, capital expenditure, and then also linking this into is this constituting a business or not on there? Okay, because we haven't got any financial figures. So that takes you through exhibit four. So if you're working this through now and we've gone through the actual requirement analysis, uh, the scenario analysis of all of the exhibits, feel free to have a go at the question, do it to time yourself. And otherwise, if you're watching this, they're going, oh, James, please, you just go through it. That's a lot easier for me. Because as you know, when you look through the solutions, these are the usual ones that you get on here. And you go, right, okay, there's part A. Oh my word, there's part two. And then, oh my word, there's a lot of information on there. How on earth are you going to make that entertaining, James, for the rest of this video so I stay to the end? Well, fear not. As ever, we have our answer analysis notes that will break it down step by step so we can walk and talk it through. So first of all, if you haven't already got down that timeline up at the top there for the 12 month accounting period, that is going to help you so, so much on there because we're going to have some adjustments. We've got events that happen after the reporting period, before the accounting period. So it's really, really key. Now, just to reiterate for this video as well, that these, these are the guideline and sample answers that ACCA provide out. And these are my notes where everything underlined again are the key facts that you need to be including and figures in your answer, along with my notes on the side. But you could be writing any other answer, as long as it relates to the requirement and what has been asked, then you're going to be fine. It doesn't have to be exactly the same to what they've got on here. The other question I always get is, oh, James, do I actually have to write, as you can see on the screen just above me, do I actually have to physically write IFRS 10 uh, consolidated financial statements? No, you do not. However, they include it within the answers so students know which standard it relates to. However, in the exam, if you can remember it, feel free to put it in because I find that students who actually include the full actual standard on there tend to be more on the ball as to, right, how am I going to actually apply it? But you could just simply put according to IFRS, but it's all about, and again, I'm gonna say it again, the application of the standards, identifying which one it relates to, which standard it relates to in that particular requirement, and then application to the scenario. Applying that standard knowledge to the given question, in this case, it was Lunaco. So we're just gonna um, run through each of the different requirements, see how you got on um, in terms of the marks on there. And this is just gonna give you a nice little breakdown in terms of the answers. So first of all, with part A, we know we've actually sold, okay, some of the shares in Starlight Co. So you've gotta be saying there straight away, okay, let's state the facts. Let's get the easy marks in the bank that we've had the disposal. There's going to be a group structure change and then we've also got, this is all from exhibit one, in the sale of shares. So the equity is reduced from 80% to 70%. This wouldn't result in a loss of control on there. We'd still account for the consolidated income and expenses for the entire year. And similarly, the disposal does not affect the co uh, consolidation of Starlight's assets and liabilities, including goodwill. So it's demonstrating the technical knowledge, okay? And talking about the consolidation on there because we still have control of it. That's what it's referring to. We've got over 50%, so we still have to consolidate the subsidiary like we would have done if it was at 80% on there. Now, this is where it gets into more of the technical aspects as to a decrease in the parent's ownership interest, which does not result in a loss of control, is accounted for uh, as an equity transaction. So that is a key term you must use in your answer on here. We've got an equity transaction going from 80% to 70%. 
And again, if you want to draw up an actual group structure so that it can help you to try and picture it, whatever works best for you on there. Because from that changing, from the 80% changing to the 70%, that is going to affect the direct holding of the parent in the subsidiary, because it's gone from 80 to 70. And then it's also going to affect the NCI percentages. So what was direct, what was the indirect actual holdings, and this is going to reflect in the changes and an adjustment in the NCI. So I'm not just going to read off the answers on here, they're all available to you, you can have a look at the notes, but just to give you a flavour for what are the things that you need to be picking up on. And then this is where it links into now that we know that no gain or loss on the disposal of the shares should be recognised within the actual profit and loss on there. So just going into it in a bit more detail as to how we would account for it, and then this is where we bring into the IFRS 10 consolidated financial statements. So really key here, so that you could have stated that we don't know who bought or sold that 10% on there. Could it have affected anyone else? That's another point you could have mentioned. But it is not clear under IFRS 10 as to what happens to the NCI interest share of goodwill. So when there is a change in the relative ownership of a subsidiary, however, it seems reasonable that Lunaco should reallocate 10% of the carrying amount of goodwill to the NCI, because NCI has gone up by 10%. This will ensure that the future impairments of goodwill will reflect the revised ownership interest in the goodwill, because they, the parent doesn't own as much as it used to on there. The 10% was sold, so now we need to increase that NCI by 10%, and you could have added on there to show a true and fair view. So to do that, we've then got to work out, right, okay, we've got to work out oh, what are the net assets of this transaction. So coming on to this, that we've got the net assets of Starlight as at the 1st of January 2006, so at the date when, when the actual sale happened, it had a uh, million dollars worth of shares. Remember, this is before the sale, when it was originally actually issued. We've then got the retained earnings on there. Uh, we've also got nine months of profit, as this is a transaction happening nine months into the year. Um, we've got the fair value adjustment on the land that actually had to be increased on there. And finally, we've got the carrying amount of the goodwill. So remember that, that adjustment we talked about for the 15%, so we have the goodwill, then we have the 15% impairment, so that is the current value of it, the carrying amount of the goodwill, 272,000. So that gives us a total net assets figure at the 1st of January 2006, when the 10% was sold, of $6.253,792 million. So since the NCI has obtained an extra 10% on there, well, that is where we're going to take that figure, multiply it by 10%, giving us $625,379 on there. And this is where your double entry will come into it, as to say, well, what has actually happened here? So, as you can see, I'll just scroll it down for you a bit better. So, there's the explanations up there, but in essence, well, what have we actually physically received from the transaction? Well, there's the debit to cash as to physically incoming to the bank account, <laughs> physically receiving the money. Then we've got the credit of the NCI on there, of the $625,379. And then finally, the balancing figure of the credit of equity to reduce the value in Starlight Co. Um, held by Lunaco on there. So that's to account for, well, Lunaco now has reduced its holding on there, so we have to reduce it by, and that is the balancing figure for the equity. There are some good tutor notes on here that a, um, a different acceptable approach could have been used for the NCI, so increasing the non-controlling interest on there by 10 to 20. However, the key thing for your notes to get down on here is, because we weren't given the full set of uh, statement of financial position, this cannot be calculated as the NCI um, at acquisition has not been given in this question. So there were other potential options, but this is the bottom line that this was the way to go about it. Calculate the net assets, find the 10%, and increase the NCI as a result to give a more true and fair view. 
So that takes you through the base of the part one answer on there. And now we've got to have a look at the actual revenue. So the first one on there for part one, we were looking at uh, exhibit one. Now we're really coming on to is exhibit two. So the sale of goods to Starlight Co. And again, you've got all the notes on the screen, key points on here as to what to go through, everything underlined with some extra notes on the side. But we've got to go through again, get the first easy marks in the bank, demonstrate your knowledge on there. So revenue should be recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. This can come over time at a point or at a single point in time. But this is the key. Those two bits are important as to the obligation and when it happens. But it's since the risks and rewards of ownership of the goods have been passed to Starlight on the 20th of March 2006, it is right that Lunaco should recognise the revenue as at that date and not when Starlight sells the goods which were after the year end. That is where you have to be really specific on the dates and putting down your judgment as to say this is the line in the sand and how we're going to account for that revenue which is in this current accounting period. So IFRS revenue and contracts with customers was the actual accounting standard to refer to on here. And then we've got to consider the actual uh, concessions or the discounts that are applied to it. So taking you down here to now the price concession, and that's all about the value of the consideration is variable and uncertain. So let me just clarify that for you, that the price concession, which is likely to be offered by Lunaco, uh, to the subsidiary that the value of the consideration is variable and uncertain. So this happens every year. They couldn't give us a specific percentage. We knew it was between 8 and 38%. So this is where uh, we require an estimate amount of that consideration in the individual accounts of Luna. And this is what it is entitled to in exchange for the goods sold. So Lunaco should either choose and you can see it on my notes on the side. So in terms of this type of contract, we've got two methods to, uh, to apply and pick from. The first one is the expected value method, or we've got to choose the most likely outcome to estimate on there. So this is where we need to choose whichever method is best to predict the amount of the consideration that it is going to, again, give a true and fair view of the accounts of the likely discount on here. So again, referring back to that we have uh, the variability and the uncertainty of so many different figures, well, what is going to be a reasonable amount that anyone who looks at the financial accounts would go, that is, a, that, is, that is giving a true and fair view as to what actually went on. So since Lunaco has a history of offering this on here, we, and we were given the eight to 38%, uh, one way of thinking about it would be that we've got the expected value method is probably most appropriate on there. However, good point to note down here for your notes is you can always state about how much information have we got? Do we need more to make an actual uh, better observation and to give a more clear picture? Because in the answer on here, they talk about at the start that we've been given 8% and we've been given 38%. So how about we take an average of that, which is the 23%. So add them together, you get 46. Divided by two, you get 23. And then that would give us a resulting revenue figure with that concession and applying the transaction price multiplied by the units on there um, of $770,000, okay? However, IFRS 15 states that when estimating the amount of variable consideration on there, revenue must only be recognized to the extent that it is, and this is the key phrase, I've even written it down here on key phrase IFRS 15, highly probable, and that a significant reversal of cumulative revenue will not be required in the future. So in other words, pick the percentage that it is most likely to be, and so that in future accounting periods, you're not gonna to have to make an adjustment for it. And this is where I talked about it at the start of the video about those flashcards. You'd write up at the top of the flashcard IFRS 15, and this is where underneath you'd write these key little notes so that come the week before, night before the exam, they're all in one place, and on each different flashcard, 
you would have each of the different standards on there. So I'd highly recommend it. It's one of the most effective ways to remember all of these little rules because there are only going to be more coming, I'm afraid. So we have on here about the risk of that. So we need to refer back to the scenario and I've put down here that it's unlikely that Lunaco can conclude that it is highly probable that the significant reversal in revenue will not be required. So that is where we need to refer back to that maximum price concession is likely at 35%. So therefore, the 35% seems reasonable for us to take. Again, same process, the $200 for the transaction price multiplied by the number of units and times by the 65% because that's going to reduce that million um, dollars down to what the revenue is actually likely to generate on there. And this is the maximum that it is highly probable um, that a significant reversal of revenue will not be required. So again, using those technical terms that is really imperative in SVR on there. Finally, we've got since the whole of the million pounds has, uh, has been included in the revenue, the accounting treatment adopted is not correct. So they've recorded it at a million pounds. So revenue should be reduced by 350,000 based on our calculations. So that gives you a nice little overview on here, but there's a really good chew to comments at the bottom that, again, candidates will be given full credit for any different assumptions you make, whether you took eight, 38, or a different percentage, uh, full concession. However, we talked about it at the start, justifying and explaining your answer based on the scenario. That is the key thing to get down there. And if you've done that, give yourself some marks on there as a result. Because that now takes us on to the adjustments for this for part three. And again, we've already had the hints about the statement of profit and loss. We talked about the revenue, cost of sales, NCI. So first of all, you're going to be having the own figure rule. So if you've got different figures that you've pulled forward from part two, and you've applied them correctly, rock and roll, you'd get the marks for it. However, just to start it off on the basics, as you can see on here, this is for the consolidated profit and loss. So there's Luna, there's Starlight Co's revenue, and again, the same figures for Luna and Starlight for the cost of sales. Now, this is where you need to demonstrate your adjustment that we've talked about up there. So we've got the revenue adjustment for uh, the 350,000, so it needs to reduce the revenue, reduce that cost of sales figure. Then we've also got the intergroup transaction on there. So we've got the 650,000. So the, the 350,000 is from the actual revenue and the cost of sales being overstated beforehand. And then the intergroup transaction on there for the 650, uh, taking into account uh, the actual uh, percentage that we needed to account for. So again, needs to be removed from the cost of sales. Finally, we've got the provision for unrealized profit, the $600,000. And again, if you want to have a look through the tutor notes just above me, it's broken down on there for you. But we've valued, again, we value those at a million dollars. Um, they're currently worth on there $400,000. There's been another, that's the transaction of the original cost to Luna. So there's a profit on there of 600,000 that we need to add back um, to the cost of sales for us. Finally, the profit attributable to the NCI. Again, this is where that apportioning comes into it. Nine months before the 10% was, was actually taken out and then we've got three months um, after it. So the three months after it, the NCI has increased by 10% on there. And the 165056 is the total profit for the accounting period. Total them up, and that is where you're going to get the 37,138. And again, for anyone who wants to look at the notes in a bit more detail, I've put them up above there, everything underlined for you. Keep it simple, that's where it's referring to. So we've got intergroup transactions, um, the goods sold, we've got the perp on there, and also the increase in NCI with the apportioning. Whew, deep breath, James. We're getting there. Part B now, part B. IS28 investments in associates and joint ventures so another another IS standard for you to write down on your flashcards and again this is now referring to exhibit three if you want to refer back to it and this is where again we've got some key terms for SBR that you need to get down 
And the first one here is equity accounting. So equity accounting. And what we've got here is the investment should be included as one figure in the non-current assets as an investment in a joint venture. Uh, this is initially recognized at cost on there. And we've got the breakdown that you need to discuss about how we treat it in the statement of financial position. So increasing it by the 50% equity interest plus the net assets, which we'll be working out later on. And then we've also got the income statement treatment that we know because we own half of it, we get 50% for the profit for the year. And, and also, Roquette will need to be included as a one line item on there. So being really specific and applying that accounting knowledge. Uh, since the profit uh, is before the deduction of any dividends paid, we, it's really important that we exclude those 15,000 dividends received uh, from the investment income as well on there. So we've got the uh, actual dividend adjustment. We've talked about the statement of financial position treatment on there. And uh, this is where we're going to consolidate it as a result now from it being part of it. But it's all under equity accounting for you. So we touched on the actual share of profits. So again, you were asked to actually calculate and discuss. So in terms of those actual profits that you can see above me now, we're gonna take 50% of the 2006 figure, and then we've got 50% of the 2005 figure on there, when we've got the total dividends paid would have been $30,000 for both of the parties on there. So hence, we've got the profit for 2005, the profit for and I'll put my mouse on it, 2006, with the 30,000 reduced. Remember, those are the total profits for both parties. That's why we need to include the minus 30,000. And the investment in the joint venture in the consolidated statement of financial position should be valued at, and we touched this earlier on, it's in the paragraph before, the six million is from the capital introduced from that cash consideration, and then we get 50% of the actual um, earnings that we are entitled to on that, which we've just calculated. Next, um, now that it's actually part of the group, so just, again, try and picture it in your mind, what is going on here. Think of the scenario, think of the transaction that's actually gone on, that previously we had a single entity concept, and here we're saying the joint venture is not part of the single entity concept because it previously was, and it is not necessary to eliminate um, transactions and outstanding balances at the reporting date between the parent and the joint venture. So this is where IS28 does require that gains and losses arising between a parent and a joint venture should only be recognised to the extent of the unrelated investor's interest in the joint venture. An exception to this rule is that the losses should be recognised in full by the parent where a downstream transaction, this is the bit I wanted to get onto, really key point there, we touched on it in the requirement analysis, um, uh, provides evidence that an asset is impaired. And we had this in this question. So again, that's just another little note for you to put on your IS28 flashcard on there, that we've got the loss of the $2 million. Uh, this provides evidence and indeed an impairment is required here. So Lunaco should recognize $2 million within its individual and consolidated financial statements. Notice how they're using the terms directly from the requirement there. We've got an adjustment needed for the year ended 31st of March 2006. And the investment in the joint venture and the share of the profits of the joint venture will not be affected by this transaction. So this transaction of impairment is all about the balance sheet on here. It's not affecting the income statement because it's not about revenue or costs or profit on there. But it's key term to get down here was the downstream transaction for you on there. So nicely coming on to part C now as well. And we've got a business combination question. And this is exhibit four for a click co. So IFRS three business combinations is a transaction in which the acquirer obtains control over one or more businesses. Again, key phrase, get it down, state the facts. But then we've got some key questions to ask here as to what, this is what it means, what actually constitutes a business? Do we have a business in front of us? Yes or no, based on this scenario. And we've got to assess whether 
the activities of a Clipco constitute a business in the first place on there. And that links into IFRS 3 and you demonstrating your knowledge. So this means that the activities have been capable and again, notice what I've underlined here in red, really, really important that the actual activities are conducted and managed in a way for the purpose of providing a return to investors or the other owners, members of the actual entity. So from what they're doing on a day to day basis, is it looking to try and give a return to the investors on there from what they're actually doing? So the uh, components of the business, and this is what I like to call of are you applying SBR terms on here? Where I've put them on the sign for you, you've got inputs, the processes and the outputs. So again, think of those transactions and, and the operations of what goes on in this business on a day to day. So you've got the economic resources that are used to try and generate outputs uh, as a result that are sellable in the marketplace. Have we got strategic management, which they refer to here with the inputs that go into those operational processes on a day-to-day -day basis. But the final key phrase that you can see at the bottom of the paragraph there, that output does not need to be present at the acquisition date for the activities of an entity could to constitute a business. So in other words, it could be a business when you first purchase it, it doesn't actually have to have any output of resources. It might still be building up to it and this will come into the future it can still be deemed as a business on there through things such as research or development costs. Next, we've got a state in our analysis. This is the key bit, which they ask for in the requirement. It can be seen that the activities of a Clipco do constitute a business on there. So as you can see just above me, I'll scroll it up on here so you can see it a bit better. Inputs are in place by having uh, secured a license. Uh, again, referring back to the scenario on there, and then linking it into the skills and experience, those are those two key terms that they referred to in the requirement again. You've got to then justify, this is all now about justifying why it is a business. So we've got performance and supervision of the clinical trials. We're actually pursuing a plan on here, looking at generating a return for the investors and the owners. And it's actually commercially developed a medicine to be sold to the market in the future. So it's not just drawn a line in the sand and then that's it. So not relevant that the medicine is not yet ready for the market. So they've been doing plenty of research. These things take time and again refer to the fact that it's part of the pharmaceutical industry. A further consideration that you can see on here is whether Lunaco may choose to apply what is known as a concentration test. And this is where if it's met and this test is completely oper um, operational, optional on there. It's all about where substantially all of the fair value of the gross assets acquired within the entity is, co is it concentrated in a single asset or not, or a group of similar assets, that the assets required would then not represent a business. So think about Eclipco, it has a license, it's got the scientists, it's got the admin team, it's doing all of these actual tests and procedures on there. So in simple terms that if, uh, if, you te if you apply the test and have the fair value of not all of them in a single asset, then the optional test would say that this represents a business. We've not got all of our eggs in one basket on there, which then links back into what they were saying earlier on as to, yes, this does constitute a business. Uh, the only assets on the statement of financial position, and again, referring now to balance sheet transactions, intangible assets on there, IS38, is that we have the license and the development of the new medicine. So this is key IS38 knowledge on here, and I'm gonna say it nice and slowly so you can get it down. Additionally, in accordance to IS38 intangible assets, it would not be permitted to recognize the knowledge and skills of the workforce as a separate intangible asset. So that is referring to the scientists who work on this on a day-to-day -day basis for the consolidated financial statements. The workforce is not separable, and this is where we've got the final notes to come on to down here. As And this is the next key phrase for IS38, you need to get written down, is it cannot be sold, transferred, rented, or otherwise exchanged 
without causing a disruption to the acquirer's business. So that is where uh, it, is, it should be going into goodwill on recognition of a business combination. Okay, so that's where it links into IAS 38. Then we've got to consider that the wages of those staff, that when we start to pay them, and again, we didn't get much information from this, so another assumption that you could make would be deducted within the income statement. Um, but then the assembled workforce represent an intellectual capital of the skilled workforce on there. So in other words, the clinical tests and the value it could produce. So again, you could have made an assumption that they could lead to a patent in the future on there, which could be again treated as an asset within the actual statement of financial position. However, prohibiting an acquirer from recognizing an assembled workforce as an intangible asset does not prohibit the intellectual property from being recognized as a separate intangible asset on there. So in other words, what actual product from a pharmaceutical perspective, what maybe formula that they come up with and they could protect and have it as an asset to themselves. So you can't account for an intangible on here, but you could have benefited from actually it being capitalized instead. And this is where finally, just to get down for your IFR, I, I, uh, IS38 notes on here, that development costs would be capitalized and are recognized under the standard, but research costs on there are not. So it states in IS38 that it's prohibited to capitalize research costs as an intangible asset. It would just be expensed through the income statement. We need more information on here again, but it links to the future prospects and other areas that you consider that you need to apply that wider business knowledge. Again, can be that little thing to pick up those extra couple of marks on there. But you must state on there as a final statement as to say, um, and in this case, it is unlikely that the concentration test would be met. So that means that it's actually going to be a business. Therefore, the acquisition should therefore be treated as a business combination on there. Big tick and more than one asset in, in the entity, so should constitute a business. And that takes you through, lovely, a nice little overview, and I'll put the fine notes up there if you want to get a screenshot of it, um, going through my analysis of a full 30 mark question for SBR on Lunar Co. Whew, and breathe. And you there going, good grief, James. Very well done there. I don't think I could have done that. Well, thank you very much. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of the video. How are you getting on with SBR? And if you've got any other questions, just ping us a message on there in the comments. Give the video a massive like and thumbs up so that more ACCA students can see these type of videos. And if you've got a friend who's also doing SBR with you, make sure you share it with them because as you know, it could be the absolute difference in going through this type of past paper question that could be the extra few marks in them getting a pass on their exam. But thank you very much as ever. Keep up the super work. And by going through these little few details on here, you could be in that 50 plus to get you through your SBR examination. But as always on that bombshell, we'll see you next time. Cheers.